Okay. Um, so today I want to talk about, my title is Inequality, Mobility, and Being Poor in America. So before I start, let me note one thing, right? All of my data is U.S. data, okay? So I'm going to say two things about that. One, to the best of my knowledge, and I've talked with my friends here in Canada, the story I'm going to tell you is pretty much the same in Canada, okay? Uh, I, I, I don't know the Canadian data like I know the U.S. data. Uh, but my friends who do this kind of work, and, and Canadians, uh, have said, yeah, basic, basic stories the same. I, I think you'll see that. Um, and the other point I'd make is something like the following. You know, if we're going to talk about inequality and poverty, and the assumption people usually make about this is when it comes to those issues, Canada is in better shape than the United States is, right? And certainly, Canadians tend to believe, and they may be right about this, that, that if these are a problem, they're worse than the than they are in Canada. Okay? So if that's true, or at least let's assume that's true, if the argument I'm going to make today is which suggests that these things uh, perhaps aren't quite as bad as you think they are in the United States, if that's true, it's likely the case that they also aren't as bad as you think they are in Canada. Right? Follow me? So if, if Canada's not as bad as the US, and the US, it turns out, isn't as bad as people think, then Canada's probably even more not as bad. Um, but I'm happy that I can point you to some resources. Uh, Fraser Institute, for example, has done some stuff on, on the Canadian data uh, as some other places as well. So if we can certainly talk about that. So uh, what do I want to do? Here's, here's my outline. Uh, I'm worried that we're going to get a little click in time, but we'll see. A uh, few things I want to talk about. Aren't the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer? And I'm going to show you data that suggests, perhaps at first glance, they are. But we're going to have to talk about this question of income mobility and whether the rich and the poor are the same from, from year to year. So that's one thing we'll talk about. As in life for most Americans, the discussion of the poor has become worse since the 1970s. This is something we hear about in the U.S. all the time. And I'm going to offer you some reasons why that's not the case and why even the story of the middle class shrinking is not what it seems to be because people are moving up, not down. Um, and I'm going to make an argument that poor American states are actually better off than the average American in the 1970s, and the average American is much better off too. And as I'm talking, this is my but what about, you might think about objections to my argument, and I think there's three, if they're not objections, they may be counterexamples that you might think of as I'm talking. Uh, and, we'll, and I'll try to address those at the end. And obviously, I'll save some time for the end too, and we'll other things that I have. So, with that in mind, what do we have here? Well, here's, here's the evidence, right? That things that inequality is a problem and that it's getting worse in the US. This is the US income distribution in 2007. We're going to talk a lot this evening about quintiles, right? About household quintiles. And the way the data is frequently divided up is we list the households from and it's households, right? Not people. Households, from the very richest to the very poorest. And then we divide them in five equal sections by the number of households. So the top 20%, that is the 20% of households who were the richest in the U.S. in 2007, earned about 60% of total income. The upper middle class, if you want to think of it that way, about 19%, 12.2 for the middle class, 7.3, 2.5. So certainly, you know, based on that, right, uh, we can see there is significant inequality. We would expect. Otherwise, right, the richest households have 60% you know, of the total income in the United States in, in, in 2007. All right, so that's a static picture. What about change over time? Okay, here's change over time. This is from the same data, but from 1979 to 2007. And you can see, right, over that period, the top 20%, that is the richest fifth of households, went from just under 50% of total income to almost 60%. And the poorest households went from 2.9 to 2.5. So if we just look at this here, if we just look at this, right, it looks like the rich are getting rich and the poor are getting poorer. And in fact, if we look over here, we can see that the sort of 80 to 99th percentage of households, everyone but the famous top 1%, was about 65% richer, right? Growth in after tax income. And the top 1%, indeed, 277.5% richer. There's our 1% friends, and it does indeed look like the richer and richer. But notice something else. The poor actually got a little richer in terms of not much, not much, right? Not much. Especially over you know, almost 20 years, I'm sorry, almost 30 years. Right? Not much, but they did get a little richer, right? And one of the things to remember about this data is that this data is talking of relative shares. It doesn't tell us anything about the absolute amount. So what I like to ask my classes when I talk about this stuff is, you know, 
I'm asking you guys. Would you rather have a sixth of a pizza or a ninth of a pizza? Under what circumstances would you rather have a ninth of a pizza? Don't tell me you're dying. <laughs> you're not eating pizza. Oh. Uh, yeah, really big pizza, right? But right. a ninth can be bigger than a sixth if the pizza's big enough. So one of the things we have to keep in mind here when we talk about these relative shares, right, is that even if the rel say the relative share of the poor dropped, it's possible that they still got richer, right? That that the the two point the two point five percent was a two point five percent of a much bigger number, and it turns out very very slightly, not really worth you know not not worth writing home about as they say, but still not negative. Anymore. So these are the data, right, that people usually try out and say, see, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, it's not bad. Okay, well, all right, but what's the problem with this? Or at least, what kind of, what would be some questions we might want to ask about this data? And the key set of questions that we want to, or the key point we want to note is that when we make these comparisons of year to year, we're not comparing the exact same households, right? The, in other words, the households, the specific people, households who were rich in 1979, are not the same ones who were rich in 2007. And it turns out that the households who were poor in 1979 are not the same households who were poor, that were poor in 2007. So this notion that households can be rich and then not be rich, or can be poor and then be richer, right? This sort of movement, if you want to think about it, up and down the uh, income ladder is what we call income mobility. And the question we might want to ask is, okay, if you start out poor, are the families, the households, that were in this lowest 20% in 1979, how many of them are still there later? Right? How many of them moved up and out of that lowest quintile? Because what this data really says to us is, the households who were poor in 1979 earned 49.6% households were rich in 1979, earned 49.6% of income. The households in 2007, who are not the same households as the ones in 1979, are this. And same thing here. The households that were poor in 1979 are this. The households in 2007, who were different households, for, to some degree, than these, are this. So the question of income mobility doesn't mean these data are wrong. It just means we have to think about this other element when we think about inequality. So let's look at, I'm going to run through a series of slides that look at income mobility in the United States different data sets, different years, and we'll see some patterns that we'll talk about, okay? So the first one, I know it's just like a blaze of numbers here, right? But this is from the U.S. Treasury based on tax return data, data from 1979 to 1988. This is, of course, the horrible, greedy 80s, Reagan years, whatever you want to call them, all right? And what this tells us is for households who started in this place in 1979, what percentage of them were in these places in 1988? So for example, if you look at the middle class, right? Of the households in the middle 20% in 1979, 5.7 of those households fell all the way to the lowest. 14% of them fell one quintile to the lower middle class. A third of them are still right where they were in the middle class. Okay? But almost another third moved up a quintile. And about 15% moved up two quintiles all the way at the top, some even to the vaunted 1%. All right? So I'm going to see what the data is showing there. It's where you were in 79, what percentage of those households are where by 1988. And you can see our poor households tell an interesting story. Of the households that were poor in 1979, only 14.2% were still in the lowest quintile in 1988. The other 85.8% .8 moved up, right? 20% up one, another quarter up two, another quarter up three, and even 14.7% of them all the way to the top 20%. So that's, that seems good, right? That 85% of poor households in one year were no longer poor in nine years later. That seems like 10 years later. Notice, though, that if you look down at the lower right corner here, households that were rich in 1979 generally stayed rich by 1988, right? Most of them were still kind of hanging up here, and some maybe fell a little bit, all right? But even if you sort of group this off, right, that looks pretty, pretty good. I want to come back to that. You might think about if there's anything weird going on there, right? That poor households seem to get richer. Rich households are more likely to stay rich. There's an interesting next question you might come back to. That. Let me show you a couple of data sets. This is from the panel study on income dynamics out of the University of Michigan. That was the guy on the It's certainly not an institution known for some kind of free market bias or anything like that. Right? 
And the PSID is one of the most recognized data sets in the social science and the sciences. You can use this for all kinds of things. What the PSID does is survey households every year and say, ask them all these questions. All right? And so they, this data set is a rock wide range here, 1975 to 1991, so 16 years as opposed to 10. And not surprisingly, right over a longer period of time, we see more mobility. We see more people moving up. But still, kind of perhaps shocking to you, maybe if I ask you to guess what percentage of poor households were still poor between 1975 and 1991. I'm willing to guess no one would say 5% unless they've seen this talk before right? or read, read the Cox and Longwood. Um, but only 5%, at least by this data set, only 5% were still poor of households that started poor were still poor 16. Later. The other 95% had moved up with a good 60%, right, moving up to the top, to the top quintiles. And notice again, right, same thing over here. If you started rich, you were more likely to stay rich. So let me ask you a question about that, right? What's, what's strange about this? The poor households are getting richer and moving up. The rich households mostly are staying rich. Is there a missing Thing there? Who are the new poor people? Who are the new poor people? Right, right. Jesus said the poor will always be with, with us, right? So assuming he's right, and I think he was about that one, right? Where are the new poor coming from? Answer? Young people. You guys, right? That's one group anyway, right? You guys graduate, you enter the labor force, you start out right here, right? In the bottom, in the bottom two quintiles. And slowly you work your way up over time, right? And you become more like this. I took my first job, some sort of out of graduate school, my first job in graduate school. Probably actually at that time had me maybe about here, but I'm certainly now take here. <laughs> okay? Right? But that's how it goes, right? Even professors, even professors at liberal arts colleges, right? Have this process happen. Who's the other group that starts that come to Immigrants. Immigrants, yeah, excellent. Immigrants also come in. And one of the things to notice about, think about with immigrants, right? You know, people might say, well, you know, okay, that, you know, immigrants, somebody start poor, that's bad that they're poor. But wait a second. <laughs> Being poor in the United States for most immigrants is a step above where they were before. So their move to come to the United States, though they fill in the lowest rungs of the income ladder here, right? The low rungs here are the equivalent of fairly high rungs in many of the places. Of course, we do see in Canada too. We do see some high-end, you know, uh, high-skilled immigration where that's not quite the case. Even for them, though, they're probably doing better here. But, uh, but certainly, lower-skilled immigrants come to the United States and Canada and do better than where they come. That's why they want to come. Yeah. Um, just to counteract. Sorry. Right, next. <laughs> Hi, you love. You take it off the hook, then they'll come think for a flight or something. When immigrants come into Canada and America, actually. Especially the women, they yeah. are forced into the, into the labor force, and then they are mis maltreated, they're uh, abused, most of them. And so to say that when they come here, they're coming here and they're living better, and oh, it's okay that they have this situation, that's a really, really insensitive thing, I would say, to pause it for. Well, given uh, what they go through when they get here. Again, let's, let's, I think we can distinguish between uh, legal immigrants, illegal immigrants, and people brought here against them. And the experience that all three of those groups have will be different. I, your description, I don't think, is an accurate description of most legal immigrants, certainly who come to the United States. Right? Women, you know, women are not forced into the labor force in, in the sense of we think of as being, you know, we think of things like sex trafficking and things like trafficking and things like that. Um, illegal immigrants is a little more complicated, right? Because they, oftentimes they are risk, they are taking more risks coming to the United States or Canada. They don't have the protection of the law in the same way. If it was up to me, right, I'd let everyone in, okay, and give them the protection. So certainly that's part. And again, part of that too is we see we see the, the sort of, I don't want to even call it immigration, right, the forced movement of people, which is the equivalent of slavery. To the degree we're talking about that, that's not, you know, that's, that's a different problem and certainly not what I'm, what I'm talking about. I don't know if that helps, but I think there's, I think the experience of legal immigrants and the experience of most, though not all, illegal immigrants um, doesn't quite match that. Certainly people brought here against the will for sure, and some illegal immigrants, I say here. For illegal immigrants though, I can speak for my own family, for instance, when we came to Canada, for my mom to even get a job here, she had to, they would not 
look at their experience from other parts of the world. I should have to go back to school, same thing with my dad. Yeah. Go back to the entire Canadian education for no yeah. reason. And then there's still racism that you encounter and sexism yes, entering absolutely. into the workforce. Absolutely. So that is why this is such a big issue to talk about. It, it is. And, I, and, I, and all the things you said I think are true, right? I mean, I have some truth to them. And I think the one, the one thing I add to that is to some degree, why the, you know, the, the reasons oftentimes why immigrants have to, to go through more education and more training to continue to work is because of regulations that put minimum requirements on their ability to work that are often put in place by existing workers in that country as a way precisely to keep immigrant labor out. And I think that's a problem. right? And we, and we should get rid of those laws and make it easier for folks like people like folks right, to come over and find work. So I don't think that's, I mean, again, I think you're right. Okay, and it's, but that also, that explains, it's still the case that immigrants coming over, even though they face those hurdles, and those hurdles are real, uh, for the most part are, in, if not right away, in short term, better off than they were. were, were, they were. Again, that's why, that's why the, the flow goes one way. You don't see people leaving the United States and Canada in large numbers to go to places. So let me take a look at some other, some other data here real quick and just sort of give you, because it turns out, this data, which looks you know amazing, underwent a big, fairly good critique from a number of economists and others who said, well, this is probably overstating things. Uh, there were some problems with the methodology here and the way these numbers were calculated. It's been, I should note, this has been an ongoing debate over the last 15, 20 years about the degree of income mobility, how easy it is to move, to move up and down. Okay? Oh, I, one more thing I want to mention is if you look at that same data and you look at actually the real income change. Everything I'm doing today, by the way, is adjusted for inflation. So just you know, if you're thinking about that, just that. Right. Um, this represents the actual income gains in, from those households. So the households who started in the bottom 20%, right? Those same households had an average income of this in 1975, right? In 1997, in 1991, it was this. Those households, on average, gained this much over that 16-year period. The households that started here gained this much, and so on. So one of the interesting things here is you can see all five groups got richer over that 16-year period. But the folks who started poor got, pardon the grammar, more richer right, than these guys did. These guys got richer. These guys got a little more richer. They got even more richer. They got much more richer. And they got richer. Right? Everybody moved up. And if you think in terms of absolute income change, these guys moved up the most. Again, it's not surprising. I don't want to make this a sort of bigger story than it is. What this is is just people going through what we call life, the income life cycle. Right? That you, you people tend to enter the labor force at lower, lower wages. They work their way up. They get promoted. They get more productive. They get raises. They make more money as they go through. They peak out in their uh, my age, frankly. Right? They peak out in their fifties, and then they kind of decline a before they retire. But that's what we see happen, right? And so a, a, a lot of what we're seeing, like if we go back to the static comparison slide. A lot of what we're seeing in that difference is just people moving through this process. So let me show you the other income mobility data real quick. This is from 1996 to 2005, so another kind of nine, ten year period here. Less impressive, right? More folks who started poor were still poor by 2005. Still, though, over half of the households, 57.6%, moved up a quintile. And even you know, almost 15%, 14.2, moved up to the top two. That's OK. Right? And again, generally, if you started rich, you stayed rich. But keep in mind, too, some folks who started rich did end up poor, not really relatively poor. And so there is, at least in the US, some significant income mobility. This is Department of Treasury data again. And then let me show you one more one last one. Yeah, this is from the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis from 2001 to 2007. And you can see this is less impressive, although remember, this is a shorter period of time. This is only six or seven years here as opposed to nine and 10. So not surprisingly, we see less mobility. So 56% were still poor, but 44% moved up. Okay? And again, sort of stickiness over here. So you know, I don't know what we want to say about that. Whether it's good or bad, I think, is, is an interesting question. Um, one statistical point, though, to keep in mind. I need my hands to the vision. We would expect that as economies get richer, income mobility should decline. Why is that? Remember what we're doing here. We have a 40. That looks great. So if we divide, you know, we have these, this sort of income ladder. We divide it into five equal parts. right? As economies get richer, what happens? Right? So 
pose those problems, right? The quintiles stretch, right? This quintile used to be here, but now it's bigger, right? And the next one's even bigger, and the next one, right? So if you want to think about it this way, if what we're measuring by mobility is kind of the you know, jumping over that line, moving up a quintile or even two quintiles, it becomes harder to do as you get richer because like an accordion, right, the quintiles are stretching out, which means the same absolute amount of increase in income might not get you out of the quintile in a later period. So in that sense, in terms of this measure of mobility by quintiles, we would expect to see less mobility as we get richer, just harder to jump out. It doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that households aren't getting richer. It just means they're not jumping out of the quintile the way they might have 10 years earlier. I don't know if everyone follows. So um, in the second ladder, are you still having that first 20%? That's still poor? Right. Or is there, that, not, yes. they not an absolute amount of poverty. We're, all this is the lowest. This is the lowest 20%. Right. Okay. So it's the it's the poorest 20% household. Right. So you know this. If you leapt up to here before, you'd be out and left the quintile. But here, that same leap won't get you out because everyone's rich. Right. So. We would expect to see less mobility measured this way, which is why sometimes people have been now doing deciles, right? Breaking it up into 10% groups to sort of now get a more fine sense of mobility. What we'd like to be able to do is kind of do what that first data set did and track the absolute income changes for households and see that, right? How much more income did they have even if it didn't get them out of the time? So again, it's, it's, one, it's one important point to keep in mind when we think about this data. Okay, so all of this is what we call intra-generational mobility. It's the ability of, of a generation of people, a set of households, to move up or down that same household. But we can also look at intergenerational mobility, which is how likely is it for the children of the rich and poor to be rich and poor themselves. All right, so now we're talking about cross generations. Okay. So if we look at the children of the rich and poor, what do we find? Well, we have one data set that's uh, out of Brookings, the Brookings Institution that looked at between 1969 and 2000. The children of the top 20, so think of it this way. The parents who were in the top 20% in 1969, they had kids. Those kids had incomes in 2000 roughly the same as their parents did in 1969. Okay? So if you started rich, on average, you did about as well as your parents did. Of the children of the bottom 20% in 1969, 82% had incomes in 2000 that were higher than what their parents had in 1969. And their median income was double that. That suggests some significant intergenerational mobility. That is, just because you're born poor, just to be more precise, just because you're born to parents who were poor, a household that was poor, right, doesn't mean you're stuck in poverty forever. In fact, 82% of those children of that bottom 20% had incomes that were higher than their parents. Did they get out of the bottom 20%? That we can't tell from this data, but at least they were higher, and the median income was double that of their parents. Again, all adjusted for inflation. So this suggests that there's some degree of intergenerational, a very significant degree of intergenerational mobility. Right? That just because you're born to, into a poor household doesn't mean you're stuck there, right? Doesn't mean you will necessarily be poor. Now obviously 18% right, of, of those households did not have incomes that were higher than their parents had. And that's that's an issue we want to think about and talk about. And I should say as a general point, right, don't you know, don't take my message to be, hey, there's nothing to worry about. Everything not, right? Even if we take the most optimistic of that mobility data, 5% of poor households staying poor, you know, to, in the United States today, 5% would be about 15, mil, about 15 million Americans, roughly, right? So we have to convert into households. But that's a lot of people, okay? And so we don't want, I'm not saying there's not a problem, right? What I am saying is, if we're going to figure out what the problem is and how best to deal with it, we better be sure exactly what the issue is. And the issue isn't that everyone who starts poor stays poor. The issue is that there's some small group of folks who start poor who stay poor. And we need to look at that and we need to find out what's driving that. Is it poor schools? Is it racism? Is it uh, limits on job opportunities? What is it, right? We need to focus in and figure that out. But just saying the rich are getting rich, the poor are getting poor doesn't help us know to focus in on exactly where that long term poverty is and then start to think about what we can do. Okay. So that's my first sort of set of issues, which, if, you know, what's the conclusion? The argument that the rich are getting rich and poor, as we frequently hear it, is I would say at least oversimplified, right? It's a little more complicated than that when we think about income mobility, we think about intergenerational mobility. The story is, to make up a word, complexified. 
right? It's a little more complicated. But I also want to talk about uh, absolute standards of living here too, okay? Because one of the things people argue is, is that you know it, it's, it's more expensive to live now than it would exist in a meaningful sense. You can see how much cheaper that is. It's even cheaper today. Okay, here's my phone. Oh, this has got some good ones on. A pair of Levi's. Right, there's my jeans. Pop back up a little bit. Find about three pound chicken. Kind of basic food. This is a chicken in every pot, right? United States or you know when we were ran for president, we're going to put a chicken in a pot. Why? Because they were expensive, right? Not anymore. 100 kilowatt hours of electricity. Here's my favorite. Computing power of a million instructions per second. Yeah, that's not going to happen. 1950, 515,000 lifetimes. <laughs> 41 weeks, nine minutes in 1997. I haven't done the calculation for today, but it's seconds, right? It's nothing today. Right. Um, and you can look at phone calls and all other things similar to that. So that's kind of 20th century data. What about, what about more recently? Um, this is just some stuff from this year's catalog between 1975 and 2006 to give you a, a basic flavor of this. Uh, you can see a fraction of what they were for. What's hilarious about this, I think, by the way, is who has an answering machine? <laughs> right? Right? I mean, you, so even this doesn't tell the full story because the, the technology doesn't. It's meaningful. The other thing I'll point out, and I'm gonna, I'll pull one more slide up. So again, basic kind of stuff. Oh, I should note, the garage door opener was a problem here. Because in 1975, uh, it was a quarter horsepower garage door opener. In, in 2006, the cheapest garage door opener you could find was half horsepower. Right? So this isn't even the same thing. This is twice as powerful for less than half the cost. So one of the things, one of the things to think about here is, is sort of that kind of issue. Yeah. So for the automobile tire, isn't yeah. like four tires? It would take two hours and yeah, so, well, so you could multiply both by four, right? I think this was the cost of one tire, right? So if you needed four, you could multiply that by four, and then multiply this by four, right? But it's okay. still going to be the same difference. Right? And this, well, for me, working in government, absolutely, that's correct. Yeah. But for someone who's working at, like, Target, for instance, that is not correct. Because I just changed my tires at Honda, and yeah. it was, like, $2,000 for four. So that's why I'm saying that. Yeah, so this is probably for one, so depends what, what, what well, uh, and then, again, I'm this was my own, like, experience. yeah, yeah, and, and again, this was out of the Sears catalog, so it might not have been as good tire as you got yeah. Honda as well, right? No question. Okay, so it's, I mean, the nice thing about the Sears catalog is, is that it's one thing that's kind of constant, right? You can look up things in that from year to year and see, see where they go. Let's. I want to look at one other set here too, and then I'll make a make a related point about all this. This is between 1973 and 2009. So here we have the retail price, right? Like the catalog. Price. The average private sector manufacturing wage in 1973 was $4.00 an hour. 2009, it's in the United States, just under 19. Here's the catalog price. And you can see the hours of work, and you can see the difference in the hours of work. So an average across these kind of basic household you know, stuff, about 70% cheaper than it was before, kind of this way. But let me make a few points about this. Um, for one thing, color TV. How many of you were alive in 1970? Maybe just me. That's depressing. Okay. I remember color TVs in 90s. Young. I remember color TVs in 1973. If you were, I don't know how big this one was, but about the biggest you could get was maybe 25 inches, maybe 19. So, color TV. Did it have a remote control? No. Right. When I was a kid, you know what the remote control was? Throw something at my brother and tell him to change the channel. Right? So no remote control. Right. Picture quality is terrible. Color TV in 2009, right, is going to be bigger. It's going to be a flat screen for that price, even in 2009, right? It's, and aside from that, you get more channels of cable and all that. There's still nothing to watch. Remote control, right? All the better sound quality, all these things. Every one of these goods is higher quality today, at least in terms of the features that it provides. Refrigerators and freezers are way more energy efficient than they used to be, for example. Okay? Um, blenders tend to be a little stronger, you know, more powerful than they used to be. Uh, Vacuum cleaners are better than they were, they're more suction, right, and probably more energy efficient too. And notice, even some of these things went up, right, in their nominal price, but in terms of the hours of working time, right, much, much less. And so these are, again, some household basics, okay, uh, that, that, you know, typical household might buy much, much cheaper, which is why, right, notice what's not on here, right, cell phone, home entertainment system, right, all the kind of other things, personal computers, not on here. Other things that we kind of take for granted, most households, and we'll talk about even more households, right? Yeah, right? 
that you know, those things aren't on there, right? Things that in 1973 weren't even meaningful, right, for, for most households. Um, notice microwaves now, right? One of the reasons we can afford all that stuff today is that all this other stuff is so much cheaper than it used to be. And people have income left over because they're spending so much, such a smaller share of their income. Even if you look over the 20 of the last 100 years, roughly, the share of income by American households spent on food, clothing, and shelter was about, in, in about 100 years ago, it was about 75%. Today, it's about 35 or 40%. So those things have become much, much cheaper, and we have income left over to buy all of these other things. Let me show you uh, the thing I want to show you. Next slide I want to show you is, okay, so this is sort of everybody, right? How likely are poor households versus the average household to have stuff like this in their house? That is, we sort of surveyed people and said, do you have a refrigerator, do you have a freezer, do you have a color TV, right, whatever. How likely would rich house, would poor households versus the average household be to have this? Turns out, the US Census Bureau does this survey and has been doing it for a while, so we have data. So don't look, don't look here, I'm just standing in front of you. Let's just look over here for a second, right? So in 1984, Here's our list of things, right, that people had, that people could have. What percentage of households, of poor households, had it? And note one thing. This is below the poverty line. This is not our lowest 20%. This is actually folks in poverty. Okay? Folks in poverty in the United States, this is the percentage of various households that had it, including 64% had at least one car. Okay? Personal computer, even in 1984. We go to 94, you can see most of these numbers go up. Okay? Freezer goes down a little bit, maybe built-in freezer. Right. Microwave all of a sudden becomes accessible to poor families by 1994. Everyone's got a color TV by 2003, 2005, right? You can see that for poor households, all these numbers are growing. The one that shrinks, of course, is the telephone. Why? Why, why fewer telephones for poor households in 2005? Fewer telephones are in your pocket. Yeah, there you go. Cell phones, right? right? This right here. And even in 2001, 73% almost of poor American households had a car. Let me tell you a little story. Related to that, uh, how many of you have read or seen The Grapes of Wrath? What's the education? Okay. Uh, if you don't know the story of Grapes of Wrath, the John Steinbeck novel set in the, the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, the story, it's the story of the family in Oklahoma who's decimated by the Dust Bowl. They decide to head west to California for, to look for a better life. They get in their old car and they drive to California. All kinds of, sort of terrible things happen to them. And it was, for Steinbeck, it was, uh, it was an indictment of American capitalism and the Great Depression, but all these things happened. So, the Soviets in the 1940s, there was a movie made of it, and the Soviets, after the movie came out in the 1940s, I guess, decided to show the movie as propaganda. Right? They, would, they set up the theaters and got you know, people to come, and it was their sort of anti American. Look how terrible, look how terrible things that happened to America, how terrible capitalism. They started showing the movie and they had to stop after several showings. Why? Because the, the Russian audiences were kind of going, wait, wait, wait. Poor Americans have a car. <laughs> right? Because they didn't. Right? So again, well, how we think about right, what it means to be poor. So last two columns. This column is all American households in 1971. What percentage of them had these various things? And one of the interesting things you can look at is, and if you compare poor households in 2005 to all households in 1971, right, poor households are more likely to have a lot of these things than the average household did in 1971. And obviously, like we had not surprised, but that's important, right? That we have this new time-saving invention, and by 2005, 91% of poor households have one. Right? Call more TV, okay? VCR, and like the answering machine, VCR is an antique today, right? Uh, personal computer, right? all these other things that, that, uh, that are there. And this is the average household in 2005, right? So one thing to notice is if you compare these, you can see that the sort of average American household has increased in all these, like all of them gone up, right? And you can also notice, right, that, that how much closer poor households are getting to the typical household by 2005. So when we look at what poor households can have, and you might be thinking, oh, well, because they're going in debt to, to get this. There's no evidence that even poor households are more indebted as a percentage of their income than they were in the past. Debt, so net, no debt, sort of distribution of debt has changed, but there's no clear evidence that they are more that they're more likely to have to be 
have more debt as a percentage of their income than they were in the past. Last point I'll make, same point I made before, the quality here is, you know, quality changes over the road. So, this leads to what my friend Don Boudreau, I like to call the Boudreau Challenge. Given the choice, would you prefer to live in 1967 with today's real median household income of almost 52,000, or today with 1967's real median household of 35,000? And if you think about that, what does that mean? Right? Imagine we could transport you back tonight. This is an operating room. We could transport you back there, and you had this income, but could only buy the things that were available in 1967. Would you do it? Or would you rather be today with all the things we have at today's prices with the 35,000? I'm thinking that many of us, if not all of us, would prefer this. Right? There's stuff today that didn't make this better. Just, I mean, medical technology is one. Right? I have slightly high blood pressure. I take a beta blockers for it. Those didn't exist in 1967. Uh, I would probably be in worse health. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of a ticking time bomb in 1967. I take beta blockers, they cost me, even in the United States, with all our terrible you know, health care system, cost me basically uh, about, I do math here real quick, about 10 bucks for a 90 day supply. You can get them at Walmart really cheap too. Okay? And they're life saving. So the question is, right? So one quick thing about the middle class in the United States, again, as I said, the middle class, it looks like it's declining, and it is declining. Why is it declining? Because more people are getting wealthier, right? In 1980, again, all adjusted for inflation, in 1980, if we think about the middle class as being roughly you know, this group here, 35 to 100,000, and that that's covers, 30, 35 to 100,000 pretty much covers this, right? The top 20% of the U.S. now is about 110,000. So it's that three middle quintiles. In, in 1980, okay, uh, almost 50%, 48.6% of households were there. By 2006, 43, 44.2%. So yeah, fewer. Why? Because so many were wealthy. Well, more than double the percentage of households above 100,000. And with households under 35,000, again, all adjusted for inflation. So yeah, there's fewer the middle classes. Okay, so, oh, two more things. Inequality today versus yesterday, right? One of the ways I like to think about it is um, that in the past, we were a society divided between haves, mostly between haves, a small group of haves, and a large group of have nots. If you ever see Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you can think about the king, right, riding through the forest. Right, and the peasants digging in the dirt, right? That was most of human history. Now the difference between rich and poor is not a difference between a few haves and a whole bunch of have-nots, but rather a whole bunch of haves, at least in the Western sort of developed, a whole bunch of haves and a small number of have more and better. Right? And that's an important difference. Bill Gates and I both have a house with air conditioning, heat, running water, appliances, cars. So do most poor Americans. We, have, we both have access to life-saving technology. Yes, it's true. This house is a lot bigger. He has more cars than I do. They're probably, I'm sure, they're nice. He does not drive a Nissan Altima with 145,000 miles on it. I'm quite sure. Okay? But it's a car. He has a car. I have a car. He might have someone driving around. Okay, true. But they have a car, too. So we have access, both middle class and poor Americans, have access to many of those things, though perhaps a lower quality or fewer. One other way to think about this is that if you walking down the street, it's hard to tell who's rich and who's poor. Um, I don't know if you know, if any of you are basketball fans, but if you know Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, a very billionaire owner of the Dallas Mavericks, he goes to their games in a t-shirt and jeans. If you saw if Mark Cuban walked into this room right now, there's no way you'd know he was a billionaire. No way. Right? Whereas for most of human history, you would know who the rich people were, to quote Monty Python, because they haven't got shit on. <laughs> That's how you know the king, right? That's a really important difference, I think, and one that we shouldn't underrate. Yes, there's inequality, but the absolute level of well-being has changed so much that the nature of that inequality has changed. And so what I want to argue is that the good old days are now, okay? 
1964, the average hourly wage was 250. It's about 21 today. In 1964, you're know, If you wanted to buy a typical home entertainment system, what would it look like? It would look like this piece of crap over here. You know, right? A turntable, two dinky speakers. Right? Your 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 buds sound better than the speakers. And a little amplifier. Notice the price on sale: 379.95. To buy that would have taken about 152 hours of labor to earn 379. Consider what you're getting. Suppose today you work for 152 hours at today's wage. That would get you about $3,200 to spend. You could do what I did go to Walmart. Here's what you can get for your $3,200 50 inch LED TV, Wi Fi, Blu ray player, home theater system, laptop, computer, Apple, iPhone 6, digital SR camera, GoPro camera, and a 3D printer. <laughs> Walmart catalog as of about six weeks ago. It's hard, I think, to argue that people aren't better off. And again, it's not like poor people are going to Walmart buying all this, but this is representative of their increased opportunity to purchase services. All right, so I said at the beginning, but what about? So here's my but what about. Maybe you've thought of education, healthcare, and health. So what can we say about these things? Again, there's differences here, especially between the US and Canada that we have to think about. So I'm going to stay with the US story because that's where the problem is. In all three of these, equality has improved in significant ways. Education, marginal value of college degree over high school is greater than it used to be, whether education is better, it's a different question. Healthcare, again, new and better treatments that didn't exist. It's true that we spend more, Americans spend more on medical care than we used to, but part of that is there's opportunities spend more to get more results than it was the case in the past. Many drugs are also much cheaper than these. Houses, the bigger, the safer, the better equipped. Um, all that's true. But it's also true that these are three industries in which government has played a huge role. And, and that role, often because of misguided policies, has led to higher costs and various inefficiencies. And we can only think of in the US, our housing crisis, you guys, because your banking system is better than ours, and always has been, uh, did feel it the same way. Uh, but you know, localized Vancouver, right? Um, but these are three issues where government play a huge role and make things more expensive than they need to be. It's a big debate in the US right now about education and rural government in making that more expensive. And certainly uh, US the US healthcare system, which is in many ways the worst of all possible worlds, uh, is is a story there too. And it's worth asking, is it really true that Americans are less educated, less healthy, and living in worse houses and are housing than they used to, right? And if they aren't, and if they have all that other stuff we're talking about, is, are things really worse than they used to be? Right? And I'm going to close with one image that uses a different talk. Um, and this is sort of makes the point that this is not just North America where this is happening. But the same trends are happening globally, just more slowly, and often in places globally that started so poor that you know, they obviously aren't here yet, but they're working their way toward it. Um, Oh, you know what? I may not have it. I don't have this. I pulled an over so I have this great image I can pull it later. It's uh, two Kenyan, uh, Kenyan uh, native Kenyans dressed in full native clothing, sitting out sort of in the middle of the plains, both of them talking on their cell phones. Right? And if you know, and one of the things about Africa is, is Africa completely, mostly leftover landlines. Right? Africa is so mobile connected. Much more so in many ways than the US is, if you know, like I'm basically going to send money my phone and all these kinds of things. Uh, and again, the, the ways in which that technology and that communication technology and the empowerment that's brought with it too has come because stuff's getting cheaper, because of innovation, because of competition, because of the power of the market here. Um, it's finding its way even to those parts of the world that have largely been left out in the 20th century. So I think the story is largely optimistic. Again, that's not to say there are problems.